Here's a, uh, a horseshoe magnet. As a north and the south pole, if we put it here on the overhead projector and get a, a little compass, we can map the magnetic field of this uh, horseshoe magnet. You'll see that it comes out of one of the poles. If we come across, disappears into the other pole and has a, a, a magnetic field there in the space around the magnet. The question might arise, well, what happens if you, uh, if you break the magnet? Now, you can't see it, of course, but underneath my shirt, I have bulging, rippling muscles. And I can just take that magnet and tear it apart into pieces like that. And uh, then you ask, your ask the question, well, you know, have you destroyed the magnet? Have you destroyed the magnetism by breaking it apart into pieces? Well, we can put uh, one of the pieces there, the small one, uh, and then uh, take the, uh, the compass and see whether or not there's still a magnetic field. And sure enough, there's still a magnetic field uh, arising on one end, which now becomes a pole of the magnet, and uh, going around, lobed around, and then disappearing into the other end. And you can see it over here on this side as well, coming out at one end, and then uh, disappearing into the other end. So at least in this piece, there's still magnetism. And so you wonder, well, maybe uh, it wound up in that piece, but then uh, isn't in one of these other pieces. But sure enough, this one also is still a magnet still a magnetic field emanating from one end, disappearing into the other. And uh, if I take the last piece to see if maybe it was the odd man out, you'll see that it's also still a magnet with a magnetic field, even though I've broken this thing into pieces. Here's a, a bar magnet, I guess, that I've made up of some smaller pieces. Uh, it has a magnetic field. And you can map it with a compass on both sides like that. And then the question is, well, if I break this uh, in half, is the magnetism still there? Yeah, it's still there. You can still, ma still do it. I could break this apart now into a yet smaller piece. It's still there. Um, I, whoops. Come around here to the end and follow the magnetic field. It's still there. And if I break it down into the smallest piece I have there, there's still a magnetic field coming out of one end and disappearing into the other. Well, the question arises, you know, how far can I do this? How far can I go with this process of breaking the magnet into smaller and smaller pieces and still have a magnet? And the answer is that you can break it right down to the atoms. And if the atoms are atoms of iron, cobalt, or nickel, then those individual atoms are tiny magnets. They get their magnetism from the spin of the electrons in the atoms. So if you go down to those atoms, at least, you have very, very tiny magnets. Now, if you put two magnets in the close to one another, uh, you'll find that they feel the influence of each other, and they'll line up, north pole attached to south pole of the two magnets, and you get a magnet that now is larger and stronger because of the combined magneti magnetism of the pieces. If I put uh, yet other pieces in there, I build a stronger magnet, and there's uh, finally uh, the remaining piece of my bar magnet, and I've built up this uh, magnet from right from the very atoms upward. Now, this is important to us because um, of the following thing. When we form rocks, Let's say igneous rocks. Those are the fire-formed rocks. And let's say we form those, those, uh, those molten rocks uh, out of materials that have iron, cobalt, or nickel in them. And if we do this in the Earth's magnetic field, then the magnets, those little atoms, will line up with the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, as this rock then cools, the magnetism will be frozen into the rock. And you could come back at a later time and uh, observe that this magnetism has been uh, frozen into that rock. Or with a sedimentary rock, it's the same kind of thing. Sedimentary rock, you're taking tiny, tiny pieces of mineral which are sinking to the bottom of a body of water. But in the presence of the Earth's magnetic field, if they contain iron, cobalt, or nickel, they will line up preferentially with the Earth's magnetic field. And then when the rock finally forms and hardens, there will be a record of this magnetism frozen into the rock. 
This magnetism and the technology to observe the magnetism became an evidence for the motion of the continents in the following way. Um, as uh, one observed rocks of, of uh, Mesozoic age, they found that the North Pole, the South Pole, magnetic poles of the Earth, uh, seemed to have moved. And one of the ways of accounting for this was that, in fact, the, the, uh, the rocks had been formed, and as they'd been formed, the magnetism was lined up with the North and South Poles of the Earth, magnetic poles, and then as pieces of the continent moved in two directions, this magnetism then began to point in directions other than the direction of our present poles. It became evidence that the continents had moved. And a similar use of the technology became evidence that the seafloor was spreading, that there was some kind of mechanism bringing up new igneous rock and that the seafloor then was spreading, getting larger.